I'm sure you all know that frustrating feeling when you lose your precious internet connection and you end up on this infamous Chrome window, which of course is the home of the super popular, well-known Chrome Dinosaur game. The game is meant to entertain you while you patiently wait for your precious internet connection to come back to life. So I've been learning Unity for two weeks now and I thought that this could actually be a fun little project to recreate this infamous browser game but transform it in 3D. And by the way, if you want to have fun with it and try the game on your own, I have posted a link to the game in the description down below and I have exported the game in WebGL format so you should be able to play it in any modern web browser. In this devlog I want to show you in a little bit more detail how I made this game from scratch, what hurdles I encountered, what lessons I learned, what cool tips and tricks I can share with you guys, all that in this episode. So as I started learning Unity, I found this really useful resource that really helped me get acquainted with the software. And no, it's not some paid course. It is actually the official learning repository provided by Unity themselves. There is this cool course called Junior Programmer. So I thought, hey, I'm a programmer and I'm pretty junior in the space of game development, this should be perfect for me. So I gave it a shot and I actually found it to be very, very useful. Now I have to say the course felt a bit annoying at times because along with teaching you Unity itself, the instructor also tries to teach you basic trivial programming concepts like if statements and for loops. And if you're a somewhat seasoned developer like me, you might be tempted to skip these parts and it might feel unnecessary, but I would advise you to bear with the whole course because along with the obvious programming teachings, the instructor does give you some valuable pieces of information along the way about some unique aspects of Unity and how it communicates with C-sharp code, for example. And all these little bits will definitely help you along the journey. A nice little tip would be to watch these videos at double speed. That really helps you accelerate this whole process more quickly. Anyway, so I was halfway into the course and one of the assignments was to create a simple 2D jumping game, but using 3D space. And I immediately thought, hmm, where have I seen this before? So there and then the groundbreaking idea was born to take this super famous chrome dinosaur game but transform it in 3D. Because basically it's the same thing that is happening in this course. Well, not really. There were a lot of things that were completely new to me that were out of the scope of the course, but we'll get into it in a moment. And I also thought that it would be a great opportunity to flex my blender muscles a bit and try to create all the game assets myself. Luckily, I've had some experience with Blender before as I was heavily learning 3D modeling two years ago. And when I was building these models, the previous experience with Blender really helped me out and made the whole modeling process a lot faster. So I started with the main character, of course, the uh, cute little dinosaur. I wanted to turn the classic 2D Chrome dinosaur into a somewhat 3D voxel type looking version of it. I thought I could just get away with importing an SVG image, extrude it a couple of times and Bob's your uncle. What I realized though, was the fact that plainly extruding an SVG gives you a horrible topology. Even if you try to force Blender to fix it, it still does a pretty bad job. So I decided to take a bit more refined approach and I ended up using a plain cube and I extruded it a couple of times to form the pixel shape. And then I used the mirror modifier and worked on refining the topology a bit to make him look a bit more rounded and lifelike. My only rule for this modeling process was to never alter the side view because I wanted these assets to be strictly identical when looking from the topological side view. This would let me stay true to the classical look and it also helped me to set some guidelines for my modeling decisions, which in the end allowed me to speed up my modeling process even more. After the modeling, I applied a simple armature to the dinosaur and I made sure that all the joints were 
rigged properly. If you ever worked with armatures or animation rigging, you probably know that even by applying the automatic weights, Blender still produces some weird weighting issues on your rig. So it's a good idea to go through your model, check all the joints separately and fix any deformation abnormalities in the weight paint mode. Let me just pause for a second to whine a bit about how much I hate weight painting in Blender. Oh God, it's just awful. I can never seem to get the proportions correctly. Very often when I draw some weights on the side, I accidentally mark unwanted weights on the other side. And overall, it's just such a messy interface to use on Blender. If you guys can suggest a decent tutorial that does a great job of explaining how to use weight painting in Blender properly, you know, what's the best practices to use, um, then let me know in the comment below because I would really like to improve my weight painting skills. Because honestly, I'm either not a natural born weight painting artist or I'm just plainly using the tool in the wrong way. Anyway, back to the dinosaur. Once I had finished a setup for the rig, I created some simple animations that I would use in my game, an idle pose, a jump action, a crouch action, an action for when the dinosaur bumps into an obstacle and of course the run cycle. For the run cycle, I just use a random cartoon T-Rex run cycle image I found online. I tried to replicate the positions and it worked out pretty nicely in the end. Throughout the process, I discovered that I still had some waiting issues on my rig. So one of the things I found very helpful was to actually run the animation, check the rig from all angles. And if you spot a deformation or an anomaly somewhere, switch back to the weight paint mode, adjust it, and then jump back to the animation. Because you will only truly find all the rigging mistakes when you actually start animating the model. At least that's what I found from my experience. So once the animations were done, I exported the whole project as an FBX file and I imported it into Unity. Also, after importing your Blender models in Unity, you might sometimes notice that the mesh is somehow inside out, and that's because the normal are inverted. So to fix this problem, just go back to Blender, turn on face orientation and check if your faces are blue. If they are, that means everything is okay. If your faces are red, however, that means that the normals are upside down, but not to worry, there's an easy way to fix this. Just select the whole mesh in edit mode and click on flip normals. This should invert all your normals in the opposite direction and it should fix the unity inverted normals problem. Next step was to create the obstacles for the dino to jump jump over, so I went back in Blender and used the same approach as before. I created some 3D cacti and also a fancy looking wing flapping bird. Back in Unity it was pretty straightforward to set up the whole scene, apply the basic motion and the physics controls. Basically these were all the things that were already covered in the junior developer course. The first hurdle I ran into was making sure that the box collider of the dinosaur would transform nicely across all animations. You see, when the dinosaur runs into an obstacle, the shape of the mesh changes. However, I noticed that the box collider stayed the same. So basically, he looked like he was tumbling down some thin air. I realized that the box colliders can actually be animated to follow along the mesh of the whole game object. There was one problem though. When importing an FBX object from Blender, all the animations were marked as read-only, meaning I could not modify these animation objects. Through some Google I found out that in order to make these objects not read-only, they need to be duplicated in Unity with Ctrl-D or Command-D on Mac. Once the duplication is created, the duplication is actually free to be modified. And thus creating these duplications allowed me to change the box collider animation settings according to the animation state. So the scene was ready, but I didn't feel quite like the environment was moving. I decided to give the floor plane a sandy color and apply a sand normal map. And since the floor plane had to be in a fixed position in order for the physics to work properly, I decided that instead of of moving the plane itself, I could actually animate the UV offset and then that would create the same movement motion. Once the animations were applied and the scene was running smoothly, it was time to make it more appealing. Not to throw shade on Unity and its default assets, but I gotta say, the default skybox looks pretty bland. 
So I wanted to create a more appealing skybox and I found this awesome YouTube tutorial by this guy. In this tutorial, he actually provides a link to a skybox shader that he had created, which simply gives you an option to create a nice simple gradient between two skybox colors. So I used this shader instead as the skybox to create more desert looking colors. There was one problem left though, the background had no motion. So I decided to create some generic low poly clouds. How to create low poly clouds in 20 seconds? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's a super fast tutorial. Start with a basic icosphere, increase its subdivisions to 4, so you have a lot of mesh to work with. In the edit mode, select the vertex, turn on proportional editing and start deforming the mesh. You can use the scroll wheel to increase or decrease the deformation area. Once you're done with your deformations, add the decimate modifier to make the cloud look more low poly. And basically you're done. Repeat this process again and again until there are as many clouds as you can possibly imagine. So for me, personally, uh, three cloud variations were enough. I imported them in Unity and applied a similar script as for the obstacles in a way that they would get spawned at the beginning of the game and they would move across the screen until they reach the end and then they would get repositioned to the starting point and again and again and again. But each next time with a different location and scale so they wouldn't look the same every time. And once all this was done we finally had some nice looking clouds. And with these modifications the scene actually looked looked more lively and the game was starting to come together. I also added a little particle splatter underneath the dinosaur legs and this really made the running motion look more lively and dynamic. Next it was time to develop the scoring interface. I wanted these legacy letters and digits to look more three-dimensional so I decided not to use the overlay canvas and the text mesh pro and all that stuff. Instead I decided to place these digits as real 3D objects in the scene. I modeled each digit in Blender as a 3D object and in Unity I made them as prefabs which the scene would constantly update and replace depending on the score. So basically on each score update the old digits would be removed and the new ones would be added in their place. Also I made sure that they wouldn't cast any shadows in the main scene and that they would have their own light shining on them. Since I was planning to export the project as a WebGL application that could be played on a browser, I also wanted to make sure that the high score would be saved in the browser history. That way, the next time the user opens the app, the app would remember the user's previous high score. I decided that storing the score in the local storage would be the easiest and most efficient way to do this. But in order to make this work, I had to find a way to execute JavaScript functions in the Unity environment. Luckily, Unity actually provides this functionality and they even have a nice documentation page explaining just how to set it up. I created two simple JavaScript functions, one that stores the user's score in the local storage and the other one that retrieves it. Then in C Sharp they would be imported and executed as special external functions. These functions worked successfully on the WebGL release build, but when I executed these functions in the Unity game view, the game would crash. So in order to make it work in both scenarios, I had to wrap these external functions in try catch blocks. That way, even if these functions would fail in the game view, the game would still continue running disregarding local storage. The only caveat was that I couldn't actually test local storage functionality without producing a WebGL build. In my case, since the functions were simple enough, I didn't run into serious debugging issues. But for more complicated JavaScript functions within Unity, this might cause problems though. By the way, out of curiosity, if any one of you guys know any good tutorials about best practices, how to test and implement this kind of JavaScript functionality in Unity projects that are based in WebGL, then feel free to post them down in the comment section below. So with the scene ready, the score in place, the game was basically finished, but there was still one crucial element missing, and that was the night view. I wanted the scene to gradually fade from day to night and back. And to do this, I created a script that I attached to the main light with a slider whose values would represent the hour of the day. 
I then made it so it can be toggled in the edit view to see the changes in real time. I modified the skybox and the light objects to take into account the slider value and whenever the value would change, it would also change the color or the light intensity based on this value. I marked down my preferred starting point and end values and I utilized the color.lerp function to achieve a gradual transition between these two values. At the end, the result turned out to be pretty awesome. Awesome. I also added some headlights for the dinosaur to see the road ahead. I also thought it would have been extremely cute to give him like a small flashlight object that he could point with in the night mode, but I didn't want to spend too much time on this project, so I decided to leave this feature out. So with the night scene ready, the project was now finally finished and I was able to successfully export it to WebGL and host it on my personal website. Overall, I noticed that the game runs pretty smooth until it reaches the night scene for the first time. For some reason, the first ever transition from day to night is a bit too heavy for WebGL to handle. So in result, some frames get dropped, resulting in a slight lag. I also noticed that this happens only the first time though. So if you're playing the game and you get past the first transition, the rest should run pretty smoothly. Honestly, I spent a substantial amount of time trying to figure out the bottleneck for this lag. I tried optimizing my day to night transition script. I tried to clean up some unnecessary calculations. I even tried adding a slight delay screen right before the scene loads where it would quickly turn on and off the day to night mode for the first time, but nothing seemed to really fix this lag. So I ended up leaving it as it is. Again, this is only my first project in Unity and I'm still learning. If anyone watching this has some idea why this might be happening, let me know in a comment down below. And with that said, this concludes my first devlog. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new. Honestly, for me, it was so much fun creating this little game project and it got me even more excited about Unity and I am now even more inspired than ever to continue learning this platform, see what it can offer. I already have some fun ideas for some cool projects in the future, so stay tuned for those. If you like this devlog and you wanna see more videos like this, then please consider subscribing to my channel because I'll be posting more videos like this about my next project in the upcoming weeks. But until then, I wish you all guys a very lovely day and see you next time.